welcome, welcome. Check, check, check. Awesome. Hello. Hi. Sounds like we are heard hey. clearly. Thank you so much for coming to our talk uh, here in one of the last sessions on the last day. And uh, we're so happy to have you. And I really hope that what we have to say today will really help you out uh, in your work when you return. I am Jonathan Owens. I'm Miriam Stiles. I work for New Relic in the Portland, Oregon office, the main engineering headquarters. And I work in San Francisco. Because we're a public company, you get to take a look at our safe harbor slide. Uh, it's worth clarifying that this is not a talk about running databases on Kubernetes. There are many excellent talks about that here. What this is actually about is running Kubernetes components themselves, much like a database. In our case, we use it to store a database of our host inventory on our different cloud providers and hardware providers from around the world. First, a small question. What's on your kitchen counter right now? You probably haven't been home for a few days. Um, you might not remember exactly. You might have a cleaner kitchen than I do. Um, but when it comes to answering questions about what you have, it gets harder when that thing is even further away. Again, you're probably not close to your kitchen right now, but what if you had a rental property, say, in Germany? Uh, could you tell us what was on that counter? Could you tell us what your rental, uh, what your tenants were doing in there? Eh, not so fun. So we had a similar problem on our team at New Relic. What team is that? Uh, we work on the Container Fabric team. That's our internal platform for deploying and running containerized services. Developers build and deploy, or excuse me, build and, and uh, push up code from their laptop as containers. Um, we then take those containers and run them on our platform. That platform runs DCOS which is a Mesos-based uh, application scheduler. Uh, Mesos actually runs the services. We don't have Kubernetes running services just yet. Uh, this is a fairly old platform. So similar to Uber's story, we picked DCOS and Mesos at a time when it was stable and served us well. And it's a pretty decently sized deployment. We have about 1,000 machines, most of which are hardware. And uh, it's running now in two regions on three different infrastructure providers, uh, again, including our own bare metal data center. And the purpose of all this, of course, is to run user services, make them available, and make them scale. So the way we actually manage this thing is a lot of Ansible and Terraform. Before we added this uh, inventory concept and used the Kubernetes components, there was a lot of, well, we got to start up machines with Terraform. Terraform's going to talk directly to the infrastructure provider. Once those machines are created by the infrastructure provider, we turn around and take Ansible, ask those infrastructure providers again for the things that we just made, then go and orchestrate the changes on the machines so that we can put them to work. For all this to function, we needed total network connectivity across these components. So from the orchestrating machine that was running Ansible and Jenkins, that might be a laptop, uh, that might be another machine in the CI system, we would need to connect over a VPN to the infrastructure provider to talk to it about what it built, and then also over that same VPN to the actual machines so that we could actually do work on them. A funny thing happened on the way to scale. We added a European region last year. This is the first new separate region that we'd had to build, and with that came a whole new networking setup, including another VPN. So all of a sudden this gets awkward, right? Which VPN do I be on? Do I have to be on a separate one to look at the European ones versus the North American ones? And then when we talked to the people that were running this project, they described a future that looks a little bit like this. This made us a little uncomfortable, as it should you. That's a lot of lines. That's a lot of networks. We can't really operate comfortably in a world where every single time we want to touch something, there's some central point that has to work on it, and we have to figure out just which cluster do we talk to at all. So wouldn't it be nice if these things could be more independent? Wouldn't it be nice if we could just sort of push this intelligence closer to the edge? So we looked hard at the problem and realized that the problem, in fact, was not one of connectivity. It wasn't essential for us to talk to all these machines directly all the time. We just needed to know what was there. We had an inventory problem and not necessarily a connectivity problem. If we can find out what's there and what's going on and have that be updated as a reflection of what's real on the ground, then we can turn back around and go over the, whatever VPN is appropriate to the region and cluster where there's something interesting going on and actually make the changes. This turned out to be a pretty good idea the more we thought about it. And well, what else could we do with this? We could actually, if we had a place where 
the state of the clusters was easily available and always up to date. We can hang more parts off of it. We can orchestrate monitoring off of this thing. We can have more self-driven orchestration if it's easy to answer the question of what's going on where. But what could we do that with? Well, we thought about using Terraform state. So if you've used Terraform, you might be familiar with the file it makes, this TF state file. And it's really useful because it lets you look at all the things that Terraform did and what state it believes the world to be in. But it only updates when you actually run a plan or when you, uh, there's a, a resynchronization operation you can do. And that only happens on demand. It's not really live. On top of that, it's just a file. So you can find it in S3. <laughs> Uh, but you have to like read and write this entire file when you want to do anything, so it's just really clumsy. We looked at commercial data center inventory management tools. This would be something like Device 42 or Nlight. These are marketed for, towards people that are running their own data centers, which we are, uh, but they're really uh, deeply concerned with things. What's the machine? What rack is it in? What are your PDUs? How many hard drives do you have on hand? And not really anything higher level than that. And we really wanted the ability to express, like, I've got a cluster. And here's what's important to me about a cluster. And here's its region. And it wasn't really going to extend into that world. As I said, we're running on DCOS. So you might be asking yourself, well, what about that? Doesn't that have anything you could use here? Uh, sadly, the answer is no. Um, DCOS, because it's built on Mesos, is really built on a responsive pattern. Mesos itself waits for offers. It waits for agents. It waits for things to happen in the infrastructure and then asks for things to happen when those have occurred. There's not really a declarative world inside DCOS and all the components that come with it. And that was really what we wanted. We wanted this pattern of declaring state. So we looked at what didn't work. What did we learn from that? And what do we actually need? Well, it needs to be a single source of truth. We can tell that much. Uh, that's the point of this whole thing. That's why we don't want to have all those lines. We wanted the ability to update it from anywhere. So you know, the European region and then future regions or future separate networks could just go and talk to this thing without having to tunnel to it. It needed to be uh, compatible with the Ansible inventory. So we want to make this one step at a time. We want to change the inventory, but we're not yet ready to change all the orchestration. And so we just need to be able to plug this thing into the Ansible script and have it go. It needs to be production quality, of course, if we're going to hang monitoring and other things off of it. And then going back to the thing we learned from the DCIM tools, we want the ability to put higher level abstractions. This is a cluster. This is a log host. Here's what's going on that I want to have happen more so than just like, where's my stuff? So being operators of a cluster and being in this space, we started reading all kinds of websites, including the Kubernetes one. And if you look at the Kubernetes website, you might find a list something like this. And you know, we looked at that and went, well, we have most of these things. OK, that's cool. You kind of need those things to run a cluster. But there's one thing on here that DCOS notably really doesn't have, and that's this centralized configuration thing. That sounds pretty neat. How could we get just that? Well, it turns out you totally can. So the API server is one of the first things that you provision when you build a cluster. And it's the thing that holds the declarative state of all the objects that represent the, the cluster's behavior. But it can do a little more than that. Um, it comes with a bunch of stock objects, like deployments and stateful sets and services. But you can extend it with custom objects that can really represent just about whatever you want. They're designed for orchestrating more complex application deployments on Kubernetes. But um, they don't have to be that. Um, so what would we need to do to make an inventory system that consisted entirely of CRDs? Well, we would need a basic object structure. So we'd need to tell the API server, here are the objects I want to talk about, things like hosts, things like clusters. And that's just a blob of YAML you'd give to the thing. We'd need something that lives inside these remote clusters to talk to the infrastructure providers and see, what do you have? What hosts are under management? What has changed? And then we just need an adapter so Ansible can work with this thing and find out what is available and what should it do. So to give you more detail about how we built those components, I'm going to turn it over to Mariam. Yep. <clears throat> so we needed a piece of code that would query our provider APIs and push data into our cube server. We wrote a pretty naive Kubernetes controller that would manage this process. And then we called them fetchers because they fetch data. They also push data, but we still call them fetchers. So we're going to go over how they work. This is the overview. And we start by making a, our API call to our provider. 
We have one fetcher per provider, and the, we are, our providers are AWS, Softlayer, and then we also have our data center. We take our provider response and store that in a Go struct internally so we can work with it. We then take that struct and convert it into a host object. Our host object is a custom resource in Kubernetes. Custom resources are really awesome because they allow you to extend the um, Kubernetes framework with their own custom resource. You get to use the same powerful APIs along with the CRUD, you get a caching, you get informers, you get watchers, and you can take all of that and do amazing things. In order to create a custom resource, um, you can follow these steps. Um, you start by doing your custom resource definition YAML file. You then create like a ghost truck that you use in your code. Um, you update the register file with your new object name, and then you run your code generation. Your code generation is where the real magic happens. That's where you get all of the files that will do the informers, the like create, the updates, the deletes. All of that is included with you. And then you apply your CRD VML file to your API server, so that way the API server says, I know what a host is. So let's take a look at a host CRD YAML file. This is what ours looks like. It's pretty minimal. It says, hey server, look out for a custom resource definition and look at, it's gonna be a host. And so it says like, hey, this is what a host is gonna look like. Um, with CRD files, you have the option to use validation. And validation can say, hey, for some fields, we don't wanna have any um, numeric characters. We did chose not to use that. Um, and we chose to just, um, but it's an option that I think can be really great in certain situations, but not in ours. This is what our host looks like in Go, and this is what we're programming with internally. And the type meta stores the kind of the API version we saw earlier, and then our object meta stores the annotations and the labels, which we'll look into. You have our spec, which represents the desired state of your object, and then your status, which represents the status of your host object. We use our labels and annotations a lot for our inventory service. Um, labels are really awesome. You can use them to search and filter. For example, if you're like, hey, I want to see all of my hosts that are log machines that are running in AWS, you can, say, you can use the command line or the API request to do that. Annotations are really great. We use them to store data about the host that we then use in downstream systems or in scripts. So now that we've got our host object, we can store it in our database via an update or create API call to our Cube API server. And it is going to a real database, it's going to etcd. One of the things you have to make sure you do is like if you're using an update call, you can possibly clobber your data. And so on our case, we use patch to make sure that we don't drop any fields in our struct object. How does it all work together in real life? Like where is our Kubernetes living? So we use Terraform to create um, our EC2 instance in our Elastic Load Balancer. We then use Ansible to um, add our certs, and then um, we use install Cube API in the controller manager. So know about the, note about the certs. Um, our certs are added by hand, and currently if we have a new human or a new service that wants to talk to our Cube, Cube API server, we need to approve the new certs, and that's a manual process. It's something we hope to automate in the future. And the only reason we're installing the controller manager is because it allows you to do the cert approval process. If you've heard of Kubernetes the hard way by Kelsey Hightower, um, we're doing Kubernetes the easy way because we're only doing the first three steps. We're not deploying any pods or any workloads. We're not worrying about any pod networking. So if you're interested in playing around with this model, I would say it's pretty simple and really easy. We're still deploying our fetchers in DCOS because that's our existing platform. In the future, we plan to transition over to Kubernetes. Um, and So now, how do we use our data? So this is what a host looks like when we get to the command line. And we can see it in the YAML file, and we take this data, and we can transform it into JSON for Ansible. And to do this process, we use a Python script that goes through and makes API calls for a Kube API server. And then um, it'll, we take that and spit it into a JSON file. One of the things we do in our Python script is filter out machines that are out of service or machines that are not working anymore. 
And you, there's actually a way to manage this life cycle within Kubernetes using finalizers. Finalizers are defined in your host, um, your host object. And what happens is you add finalizers to your host. And then when you make a delete call, there's a deletion timestamp added to your host object. And then you'll have a controller that watches for deletion timestamp and then do any steps needed to delete the host and it'll remove those finalizers. And then the host will properly be deleted. We're not currently doing this. We have yet to, we have the finalizers in our hosts, but we have yet to write the code that would actually remove the finalizers and watch for deletions timestamp, but it's highly recommended to implement that. So let's talk about how we're expanding these patterns. Thank you, Miriam. So we found this pattern to be already really useful, right? We spent a lot of time on how we use it for inventory, but that was really just like the first thing. Uh, as soon as we had this place where we could easily define declarative desired states for our cluster, a whole new set of opportunities opened up. Uh, you know, we went from this world where we had this sort of phased manual back and forth. It was very iterative. It was very uh, hand-driven. And it really couldn't take us into a multi-region future. With the API server in the middle, just the way it's made, it's made to run in this really decomposed way with lots of clients that don't necessarily know about each other working on objects together. And the two kind of big aspects that make this possible is the TLS uh, mutual auth over, that's suitable for use over the internet. So that lets us get rid of the VPNs. Uh, that lets us get rid of the sort of network connectivity requirement. And then the other aspect is the way it does consistency ordering for clients. So when clients make an update request and then they try to uh, post it back to the server, if another client has already changed that object, they get told. And so it's very easy to coordinate lots of things that work on the same host. This lets us add more stuff. So if, if we've got a place where we can declare how things should work, we can then use that for other things. So we used to do uh, monitoring. I'll pick out that as, as an example. When we added hosts to our monitoring system before, it used to be Git-driven. We would have a script that would go and do basically what Ansible does, go and ask for all the servers, and then create a config blob in a Git repo, and then the monitoring server would go and actually pull from that repo and update its configs based on the repo. Well, that's just like Kubernetes with extra steps, right? Like this is a big hassle. So instead, we get to do that dynamically. We were able to lift up all that monitoring logic into the API server. So now, as soon as the inventory changes the host objects in the API server, the monitoring server can pick that up right off the data plane, because they're listening for new hosts, and go reconfigure itself right on the monitoring container. Way faster, no pull requests required, no Git connectivity. Uh, it's just much simpler to think about. Really, anything that needs updates about what goes where can do this. So you know, monitoring's a great start. Uh, we really want to go further than that. So you know. It's not yet declarative. The host objects that we have are just really status. There's not really a spec that we rely on for much yet. Uh, and creating a new one only happens when a new one actually appears in the infrastructure provider. So Terraform is still making direct calls to the infrastructure. There's no controller for building new uh, instances like a cluster autoscaler might do. Similarly, Ansible has to just like go reach directly out to these machines. It's not running right on the machines. Though, we have managed to actually build on this a little bit. We now have a component that lives on the actual hosts that monitors for when changes need to be uh, run by Ansible. And they can go ask for Ansible to be run on them. So it's like a little half step towards having self-managed clusters. Uh, and we expect to continue to evolve that. Uh, please ask for more details after if you're curious uh, or contact us online. So this is how we came to think about Kubernetes. You need a lot of parts to make Kubernetes go. All those features you saw earlier, each one of those is like an entire software project in and of itself. It's like a hamburger, right? You need a lot of stuff to make a hamburger. You need something from the bakery, something from the ranch, something from the dairy, something from the garden. And they all come together and make something sort of greater than the sum of the parts. But you know, if you just take the cheese, like cheese is good, <laughs> just on its own. And uh, you know, we took this sort of cheesy part of Kubernetes, this sort of thing that's delicious on its own, 
and made a sandwich out of it. You know, and it's still cheese in there. It's just it, it's sort of differently shaped when you eat it all together. So you know, we encourage you. It was so valuable for us to look at these parts of Kubernetes, look at the opinions about how distributed systems work that are baked into the code, that are encoded in it, and then think about how you can apply that to your own systems. We've struggled for years with this pattern of how do we converge lots of stuff. And the folks that built Kubernetes have too, but they've come up with ideas that are better than we could. Uh, and we've had a lot of enjoyment applying them to our world. Thank you so much. We'll take questions at this time. And uh, we're so glad that you came. Um, thank you. Woo! <laughs>Please shout out your questions. We will repeat them for the benefit of the audience. No questions? Come on, you don't have to ask me like what I had for breakfast this morning or something. Yes? Uh, the changes that are happening in Kubernetes, what do you think? Uh, do you think this is going to last the test of time? Do we think this will last the test of time given the changes happening in Kubernetes? Yeah. Absolutely. So the custom objects and the custom resource definition are continuing to be expanded. Um, I see movement happening, especially in the API machinery SIG, to expand on what custom objects can do. Uh, ideas being thrown around include things all the way up to and including converting all of the core Kubernetes objects to CRDs themselves that get loaded when you install Kubernetes or even generally just teasing apart more of the API component from Kubernetes core objects. Um, you know, I don't think we're running at cross purposes with what they're trying to do with the API server at all. Uh, and the more we talk to them about it, the more kind of useful things are emerging from that dialogue. So yeah, we think this will totally go. Yes? Uh, I came to this, it's interesting because they have been talking about breaking out things into CRD mm -hmm. uh, and really just kind of having Kubernetes be a scheduler, an API server, and you know, object management, things like that. So it sounds like you guys basically built a CRD, if you were to put it simply, right? Yes. That was the, the core insight was that like, what if we didn't write an inventory service? What if we just use CRDs as the inventory service and then wrote the machinery around it to make that CRD useful? Yeah. So what made you decide, I guess you talked a little bit about it, but this is not a logical, Kubernetes is not something usually people look at outside of containers. What put it on your radar for this purpose? Uh, what put Kubernetes on the radar for this purpose and not others? Uh, so we were looking at moving off DCOS and to Kubernetes and still are. And so this formed sort of the camel's nose under the tent to go like, well, what if we just use this part? How would that go? And it gave us an opportunity to learn the system. Uh, we've seen other teams inside New Relic look at what we've done here and go, I want that. And so we've already got a team using it to manage their load balancers. Uh, any place where I want to declare state in some flexible way and then serve that and reify that in, in actual machines, it's proven to be pretty useful. Um, I don't see any reason why you couldn't apply this to non-containerized systems. And is this open sourced? Is this open sourced? Uh, no, we would like to. I think the fetchers, especially for things like AWS and IBM Cloud, are pretty, like you could make those generic in a meaningful way. Uh, right now we're working with another team inside New Relic to get them to use this as well for their uh, large cluster orchestration. And I think as part of that process, we'll look at teasing that apart because I don't, there's no reason why we couldn't make these open. They're pretty, pretty powerful. So yes, we're working on that. Yes? Um, are the fetchers making use of, of watching these CRDs so that they just kind of come to life whenever you push a new one? Or um, is that part of how it works? Or is it just kind of pulling the API periodically? Marion, do you want to take a look? Yeah, it's pulling the API periodically. Okay. Um, we want to do something more smart like that, but since we don't have a ton of hosts, like we only have like a thousand, right now we're just pulling. Thank you. We have time for a few more questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so the question was, how do we deal with, are we thinking of replacing this Terraform flow where, where Terraform still has to go and reach out and make things uh, without being queued by changes to the CRD? Does that reflect the question? Um, so because of our migration plans off DCOS, I don't think we're gonna make that change on this system, but when we uh, start building Kubernetes clusters, we absolutely want to do that. And so we're trying to get really plugged in with the cluster API folks because uh, they're talking about a design for managing Kubernetes clusters that is totally this idea. You make a cluster object, then you make controllers that create that actual cluster in the real world. That's the world we want to operate in, because we expected our scale to have many clusters, and I don't want to manage many clusters with like a whole bunch of pull requests to all over the code base. I want to make just an object in an API server and have it go. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where we want to be. I hope to come back next year and be like, check it out. <laughs> Cluster API, it's the thing. Yes? <laughs> Sorry. So do we expect to continue using this when we're off DCOS? Is that yes. characterized? And, and why is it difficult to move off DCOS? Uh, two excellent questions. Um, I do expect to, I don't know, what do you think? Do, should we still use the host objects to manage Kubernetes clusters? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. If I think with the machine, like from cluster API, the right. machine type, we probably won't have to worry about it as much. Yeah, the cluster API folks have a whole set of CRDs that they've defined that are pretty close to what we're doing here. So they define a machine object and a machine set. Um, we're gonna look real hard at that because you know, we may have to straddle two worlds. We may have a host inventory that has both machines that are running DCOS and also machines that are running Kubernetes and those may take different representations. Honestly, we don't know. Um, we'll see. Uh, as for what's hard about moving off DCOS, um, I think in our case, it's not actually going to be that hard because all we run on DCOS are stateless services and those are pretty easy to migrate to Kubernetes. Um, I think what's going to be hard is, is pulling on the stateful services, which we do want to run on Kubernetes and we're very early in that process still, so we're, we're not certain yet. We've made it easier on ourselves. It's, it's not um, shown in the architecture diagrams, but we do have a piece of software that sits in the middle. So when teams deploy their services, they go through a piece of software called Grand Central. That's what actually talks to DCOS and creates the applications. We expect that same flow to happen when they deploy to Kubernetes for the most part, and so we just change that part in the middle, the Grand Central part, and have it just deploy to another cluster and have that go. Uh, which makes it easy for the service owners and hard for us because we have to make sure that both of those things work well. All right, any more questions? Yes? Have you noticed any conflicts between DCOS and Kubernetes? There aren't any conflicts because they're not really talking to each other. The fetchers are deployed in DCOS, but they're just communicating with the Kube API server via um, um, API requests, just over like HTTP requests, so there's not really any like fighting that would happen. There's no such like space for that. Yeah, we're only running like just this small part of Kubernetes, right? There's no CNI, there's no kubelet, there's no you know service objects, no IP mapping, and so all the parts of Kubernetes that sort of do interesting work that might be in conflict with DCOS simply aren't running. Uh, and when we stand up Kubernetes clusters, we expect them to be on separated equipment. We're not going to try to like co-locate those. I think that would end in tears. All right, one more question. Oh, yes, sorry. So the question is like, what's the source of truth? And it seems like, yeah. So how, like who asserts what a host should do and what it looks like? Yeah, 
uh, I think it's mostly Terraform, right? Like when we make a host and we, we give it a role or we give it labels, that mostly comes from Terraform, right? I guess it depends, right? Because we have AWS and we have our data center. So for our data center, we would just change the role like in the API calls and then when Cube API queries that provider, it would know all of that. Um, with Terraform, yeah, I guess you would just, it would end up in AWS, the API somehow, and then that's the API would be. I guess the API is really a source of truth and then Cube, Cube API is like leaning on that and that's where it's getting all of this data from. So I wouldn't say, I would say it's the provider and not really Terraform. Much of the intelligence about what a host does in our system is determined by the host name. So that gets set on creation of the host and then almost every tool that sort of is downstream of that is like, oh, you're one of these, I'm gonna do that thing with you. Um, and that's done not for any particularly good architectural reasons, um, but it, you could, conceptually it's the same as like putting a bunch of labels on it, which is how that's often done. All right, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you have a great conference and a safe trip home.